Kamala Harris interview. I think it's hilarious and it's frustrating and it's like I can't wait for the election to be done but it was kind of nice to see how Kamala Harris was on sitting on the hot seat pretty much very unlike the things that I saw last election season which was during covid remember those days remember how biden would not go out but he would stay and just do a lot of video interviews and even then they were very like edited very um he wouldn't talk to just anyone as far as i remember and it was very interesting to see how it went from Biden being the nominee to Kamala Harris and I thought they decided to go with that strategy with Biden because of his age because of the things that he said that are inappropriate so they wanted to like reel him in and, and just stay in control of the PR but it's very interesting to see that it seems that they were using the same strategy with Kamala Harris vice president kamala harris i thought that she was just going to bring things back to normal and she was going to talk to just anybody she was going to be very open with reporters and then it isn't until recently that she's i think this might be one of her first uh, interviews that she agrees to do with someone that is not going to vote for her that is not going to be giving her softball questions. The thing that makes me feel like, oh my goodness, like this is so delicious. This is so wonderful that I get to see her like in this situation. It's just because how would you feel as an American, especially someone that did not vote for Biden? How would you feel just seeing, you know, you accept it, you accept this is my president, this is my vice president, but not just, oh my goodness, look at all the, the laws, policies that they're pushing, right? But their approach to reporters as well, the way that they would laugh at how reporters were trying to ask Biden questions or just... The thing that I'm seeing, it's almost like, and I know I'm biased, so you can call me out on that in the comments if you want. But to me, it seems like Kamala Harris is kind of like this princess type of elite kind of, uh, she gives me that impression. I've really been struggling to figure out like, who is this person, you know? It's been hard for me. So the things that I've observed, especially in this interview, was kind of like this, I'm not going to let you like lead this interview <laughs> i'm going to talk as long as i want you know i just want to be able to say everything i want like if it was a debate you get your two minutes to answer a question or whatever and this is an interview this is completely different you follow the lead of the person that is interviewing especially if you are on their time and this is going to be on their channel so you just kind of have to roll with it if you didn't get to finish your answer you just wait for the interview person to interrupt you and then before you answer their question you go ahead and say let me just finish what i was saying and then i'll answer your question that's how i think she would have done much better on this interview if she would have taken that approach however i think what's going on is that she wants to come across a domineering she wants to come across as someone that has control over the room in in the room that just didn't translate too well in my opinion i think a lot of voters don't want that they want to see respect, mutual respect. They want peace. They want tranquility. They want someone that demonstrates self-control over emotions and that they will do that on the world politics as well. If in the event that she were to become the president, replace this interview guy and put like one of the worst leaders, world leaders in the world, like how would you manage someone way worse? And is this going to be the way you deal with it. There was a situation where I'm going to show you this clip where she was completely talking over the interviewing person. And I think I know why, because it, it was completely devastating to her. So she could not let people hear him speaking. And 
I will show you what she didn't want people to see. They showed it on the screen, so I'm going there. You can find me on X or Twitter at Mrs. Susan Morales. That is a fact. Madam Vice President, two more things. You were asked on 60 Minutes about the biggest threat that the world faces, that the U.S. faces. This is what you said. Which foreign country do you consider to be our greatest adversary? I think there's a, an obvious um, one in mind, which is Iran. Iran has American blood on their hands, okay? The, this attack on Israel, 200 ballistic missiles, um, what we need to do to ensure that um, Iran never achieves the ability to be a nuclear power, that is one of my highest priorities. So that was an interview with Kamal Harris telling us, you know, she's someone that is in the behind the scenes leading our government, the United States of America. And based on the information, I don't know how limited it is for a vice president compared to a president, but if she was completely informed about the situation, uh, the real threats, then she said Iran is our major threat. And so here comes, what was his name? His name is Brett Bayer, I think. So this is what he says. A number of extra experts thought you would say China. Um, the FBI director had said that. But you said Iran. If that's the case, what do you say to critics uh, who look at the actions of your administration and say you're not acting like Iran is the number one threat? Well, I, I will tell you most recently, whether it was in April or in October, in the s several hours on each occasion that Iran posed a threat to Israel, I was there. Uh, most recently in the Situation Room, in the most recent attack, working with the heads of our military and doing what America must always do to defend and to support Israel in its requirement to defend itself and to give American support to be able to allow Israel to have the resources to defend itself against attack, including from Iran and Iran's terrorist proxies in the region. I'm pausing it there. So far, she's saying the right thing, and I'm glad because Israel and the United States are allies. It's great to promote the well-being of Israel. A large amount of Americans have this Christian uh, worldview, and every time we're reading our Bible, we're reading the history of Israel and the founder of Israel, God. So there's a special interest in a lot of our hearts, I speak for myself, when we hear about Israel, we want our country to do our part whatever that may be, whatever appropriate, you know, measure that might be, we want to support Israel. Here she's saying the right thing. She's saying that's where we stand. She starts off by saying, in response to, your critics are saying that if you really believe that Iran is uh, the biggest threat to our country, your critics are saying, how come you're not acting like it? And she, her response is saying, I was in the room when, like during significant moments, I was in the room. I guess what she's trying to imply is that I was having conversations with the leaders. I was influencing. She didn't really say that. She just said, I'm in the room. What comes to my mind is like, well, you were not in the room recently when the prime minister of Israel came and gave his speech. Why wasn't Kamala Harris in the room where she was supposed to be because it is her current job to be there and to preside over that speech. I'm going to share what was going on. So you can fact check her and really see if you can trust what she's saying. I'm going to read from CNN. Harris to skip Netanyahu's speech to Congress, but plans separate meeting. This was 
Monday, July 22. Updated. So Vice President Kamala Harris declined to preside over Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's address to Congress on Wednesday, a source familiar with the matter told CNN. The decision to skip the joint meeting underscores the tense relationship between the Biden administration with Netanyahu at a time when the war in Gaza has caused growing backlash from the left. An aide to the vice president said the two world leaders will meet separately later this week. Harris's aide cited a previously scheduled event as the reason for missing the speech Wednesday. So what was more important than Kamala Harris doing her job? A date for the Netanyahu-Harris meeting has not been announced, but it will be separate from President Joe Biden's planned meeting with the Israeli Prime Minister. And I went to see if she did follow up and did meet with him separately. And I'll read to you the, the White House uh, statement after. The, cl the closely watched bilateral will mark Harris's first meeting with a world leader since Biden stepped aside from his re-election campaign and endorsed Harris's candidacy. It, I mean, if she's thinking about her campaign, which she is, she could have used this opportunity as I was in the room also when Netanyahu came and gave his speech. You know, that shows it's a, a demonstration, a visual demonstration to everyone, to America, to the left, to the right, to Israel. This is a person that was, is supposedly a potential future president. This isn't just a vice president. This is, this is a representative of the United States at this point, you know, to a larger degree than just, you know, vice president. This is like potential future U.S. Uh, president and where the U.S. stands or would stand when it came to Israel. And she chose to be somewhere else. So Harris is expected to continue her intensive engagement on the conflict in Gaza, the aide said, noting that she is expected to underscore a commitment to ensuring Israel can defend itself condemn Hamas's attack on October 7 and reiterate concerns about the humanitarian situation in Gaza. So those are the talking points that she gave in the interview as well. We anticipate the vice president will convey her view that it is time for the war to end in a way where Israel is secure. All hostages are released. Yeah, that would be good. The suffering of Palestinian civilians in Gaza ends and the Palestinian people can enjoy their right to dignity, freedom, and self-determination, according to the aid. And they will discuss efforts to reach agreement on the ceasefire deal. I mean, you would think that she would add the end of Hamas, you know, the end of the Hamas brainwashing of the Palestinian people or whatever. On Wednesday, Hara, Hara, Harris is set to address ZF, I don't know how to say this, Phi, Phi, Beta sororities, Grand Bobu in Indianapolis, for a moderated conversation, an effort to engage Black women voters. I'm pretty sure that Black women voters are probably already are on your side and that they would be more than happy to reschedule because they want to support how important this this being present in Israel's uh, prime minister's speech is you know the the situation they would understand right her travel to Indianapolis on July 24 should not be interpreted as a change in her position with regard to Israel, the aide said. I just feel like you're lying to me at this point. I don't, don't insult my intelligence by trying to lie to me. You know, I respect you more if you just tell me Kamala Harris is not on friendly terms, is not in agreement with Israel right at the moment and so she will be skipping and she will she prefers to have a separate uh meeting because she is not in favor of the way israel is conducting itself but you know that would mean that 
she would lose support from people that are definitely advocating for Israel's safety. And so she's, she's trying not to lose the people that are all about the whole free Palestine on the left. And who knows, who knows what she actually thinks too. Maybe she, she believes like they do about how the whole Israel being oppressors. I don't know. Honestly, I think it's just a political game. I think she's an expert at playing the political game and it's nothing more than a game, a power game to her. That's the impression she has given me. I am someone that can be persuaded. If she says, does the right thing, I can like, oh, okay. Kind of like when Biden, when the whole, uh, the attack on Israeli civilians first happened a year ago, I was not happy with our president Biden, but the way that he came across, you know, very clear, where the United States is aligned, I thought, yes, he did the right thing. And I will always give him credit for that moment. Later on, not, not the same Biden, but let me read to you what happened. Um, here we have the White House statement. Read out of Vice President Harris's meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel. Vice President Kamala Harris today met with Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel at the White House. The Vice President reiter reiterated her long-standing and unwavering commitment to the security of the State of Israel and the people of Israel. They discussed the Biden-Harris administration's work to ensure Israel can defend itself from threats from Iran and Iranian-backed terrorist groups. So this is the White House. The White House is telling us Americans that there are countries, there are groups of people that are jeopardizing Israel's safety. They list them here, Iran, and not just Iran, but Iran is, is backing other terrorist groups. That's what they mean by proxy groups, including Hamas, Lebanese Hezbollah, or Hezbollah, however you say that, and the Houthis, and the importance of combating the rise of anti-Semitism globally. The vice president again condemned Hamas as a brutal terrorist organization, as well as individuals associating with Hamas, noting that pro-Hamas graffiti and rhetoric is abhorrent and must not be tolerated. Good. That's like the bare minimum. I'm glad. I'm glad to see this written. Now you saying it and the way you act are completely different things, right? And that's where we're going to continue the interview right now. The Vice President and the Prime Minister Netanyahu discussed developments in Gaza and the ongoing negotiations on the ceasefire and hostage release. The Vice President echoed President Biden in expressing the need to close the remaining gaps, finalize the deal as soon as possible, bring the hostages home, and reach a durable end to the war in Gaza. And so it's kind of like one of those things where you have a problem and a bunch of outside people are telling you, you need to, you need to solve your problem. Stop this problem from, from being in your life. And yet, you know, they just walk out that door and, and they don't understand the, the complexity of what they're talking about. How, awful you feel in the situation and they offer no solutions and that's exactly it's it's very annoying to hear a lot of the american rhetoric regarding this issue and when you know how if the united states really wanted to help them they could have you know and this whole two sides thing isn't really helping i'm not saying to be okay with anything bad that actually happens to to innocent people that are not in favor of terrorism. Because I think that if you are civilians, but yet you are in favor and you are doing your part to promote this government, then I think you deserve to suffer the consequences of the leaders that you have chosen and that you support. And if there was an election, you would still put these same people there. So it's like, 
hey, you chose your leaders, you chose the consequences that your leaders put you in. I think that's fair. That doesn't mean, yeah, that Israel should do evil things, which it, from what I've followed along, Israel is doing their best to not do bad things to innocent people. Putting it very simply, uh, there are a lot of things. I, a lot of things like one, for example, before they, they are going to attack uh, or like bomb a building because they're um, the really bad guys are in there to put it simply. They give warnings. And from what I've heard, they even call people. And there have been situations where they call certain people like in an apartment building or something. And and they they plead with these people, hey, you know, tell as many people as you can to get out of there. And uh, I've I've heard that they've dropped like uh, papers telling them, and and they've even told told people go over here while we're doing this, and then you know, so uh, they've provided a lot of humanitarian aid, more possibly than is even necessary. And the real problem for why people are. Uh, they say that people are starving in some of these areas is because Hamas, they are stealing the humanitarian aid from their own people. So you have to stop blaming Israel at a certain point, you know, it's just so dishonest. The one thing I don't, I don't respect and I don't like is for politicians to lie to me, blatantly lie to me. It's disgusting. I would rather you hold to your evil views but be honest about it but obviously people that hold to evil views are also going to hold evil values and honesty is not going to be one of them uh, the vice president expressed concern regarding civilian casualties and discussed the need to alleviate the humanitarian crisis in gaza the vice president also expressed her concern about actions that undermine stability and security in the west bank such as extremist settler violence and settlement expansion see that you, the last words in this statement that gives me a hint like there's something else going on that we are not aware of and she is not being completely open about about her views on Israel. Let's go here, continue this. Right. And that but those is proxies and, were and funded my by commitment Iran. to that. Okay. So he, I need to repeat what he's saying because she she didn't want she didn't want people to hear. Yeah. It's, it's different. It's on a little more comfortable. Hold on. <laughs> All right, here we go. Um so he says, you know, those are proxy groups from Iran is unyielding and unwavering. She just wanted to finish her statement that her support is un, you know, unyielding and unwavering. Like really? <laughs> this, the end, especially the end, I think I understand, like I've been trying to understand who is this Kamala person? My impression is she is one of those people that in real life, they are not interested in hearing you. They are not interested in you. They are not interested in learning your thoughts, your concerns, your criticism, your constructive criticism. And they only want to be heard. And they will disrespect you and they will talk over you and you will be shocked. You will be shocked. Like, like sometimes you come across certain people and you're just shocked because it's so counter how you are and how you would treat that person. So that, that, that is my impression of her. It's like, oh, she's one of those people. So here we go. Critics just say that you either relaxed or failed to, to enforce sanctions on Iran, allowing all of this money to flow let, into Iran, like let, billions let, let's in Let's go back oil to Donald profits. Trump. Mm -hmm. Here she goes. She's like, let's go back to Donald Trump. <laughs> um, there's a scene in the movie Liar, Liar. He's a lawyer that cannot lie. He He's defending just 
a, a really difficult client to defend without lying. And so the judge asks him, what's, what's your uh, reason? And he's like, because it's devastating to my case. <laughs> and in the same sense, she did that. She's, she, um, he's bringing up something that she, as a public servant in the United States of America, a democracy, as she's going to say, she must answer to the people. She must answer this question. She must take accountability for her actions and say the bare minimum, like reassure people, um, as president, I would do this differently. And if you're not, then it's, you're kind of telling us that you're okay with what was done and that the same can be expected. I mean, yeah, that's speculation. That's an assumption, but that's just how it is. Like when you are appalled by something, you're going to own it. Again, values, right? No values, apparently. Okay, maybe values are power. Hold on, who pulled that out of who pulled out of a deal? That so here is a screenshot uh, that it says Iran oil revenue estimates in billions, and it has the estimates in billions for the years 2021 all the way to 2024. I'm pretty sure she can see it because she's been able to watch the videos that he would play on this interview so i'm pretty sure that she saw this and she's like well let's go back to donald trump donald trump i'm i'm very confident that the whole strategy her team herself they felt very confident that they can do well in an interview at, in, at fox because she would just turn it around to donald trump you know and so here we go. I would have actually put but here Iran the, in check. The estimates and in billions. During Donald Trump. Okay. Before we try to listen to her, he is saying this. She didn't want you to hear this. If Iran is truly a threat to America, why were you soft on the sanctions? Why didn't you enforce? Why didn't you make it? harder for Iran to do very well financially through their oil. So why are your actions not the same as your words? And why did your actions enrich our greatest threat? Who did such a devastating thing to Israel? And now we find ourselves supporting this war with Israel we have this problem in the Middle East and we could have done something about it while you were vice president. And she's not answering that question. Instead, she wants your attention off of her and Biden and she wants your attention on, well, Donald Trump. That's the thing that annoys me. The whole interview, I was so annoyed until I started to find it entertaining because she started to like just her, her emotions got the best of her. She did not remain composed and it's, it's quite, I don't know, funny to me. Yeah, let's see what, what, what she says. That administration go towards that Iran. Iran. <laughs> and they're both talking. And usually uh, when I do interviews, you know, um, the interview isn't, the interviewing person is in charge, like, Sure, if you're talking, I have something to say, but I choose, do I interrupt them because I want the interview to go this way? Or, you know what, I'm just going to let them finish their thought. But at some point I have to step in and you're kind of talking too much. I kind of don't do that. I, I do let people talk because for my reasons, but this person was on a very, very, short amount of time schedule and um and and she seemed to think that she was in charge of the interview <laughs> so they both are talking when you're being interviewed and the person interviewing starts talking hint hint oh let me stop talking and instead she talks over him and it's funny because 
he's talking about he's trying to ask her a question and she is still trying to talk about trump and they both kind of pause on the word iran i think that was the word right and then he he's very clever because he had to maneuver the situation regime that that we had a, an american military base that was attacked where american soldiers suffered traumatic brain injuries and Donald Trump dismissed them as headaches not to mention Madam how Vice Donald President, Trump has all of this money has treated and has talked about America's mil she wants to talk about and I don't believe them I honestly I, I do not believe their what is it anti-Trump propaganda I'm not saying the man is perfect I'm not saying the man is even like I don't know what to say I, I Trump is another person that I'm like how do you define this person? But I I do believe Trump over Kamala, especially because during debates, if you have a somewhat fair moderator, you get to hear the charges against them and you get to hear specifically Trump or the vice president choice for Trump explain what the actual context was and uh, where they actually stand. So when I hear Kamala say things about Trump like this, I'm like, oh, okay, they must have found a certain thing and they decided to spin it and they're just parroting it, you know? So honestly, I'm not interested in hearing what he said. I'm more interested in hearing what you have to say about yourself when you are still and have been in office as the vice president. Military and military service people Critics calling them that suckers and losers Hamas has diminished and the significance. We're talking over each other. I apologize. Well, I, I, I love how he, he did this. We're talking over each other. And he apologized. <laughs> so smart. The, the men that I have come to respect a lot in the political arena are gentlemen. Gentlemen that are smart. And you just can't lose. If you're firm, you're smart, and then you you don't lose your cool and you still come across as a like a humble, respectful person. And he did that. And I and but, I, but I, I, wish, I would like that we would have a, a conversation that is grounded in full assessment of the facts, which includes I think this interview is supposed to be about the choices that your viewers should be presented about this election, and the contrast is important. She's filibustering. When you just talk, 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 talk to like take up time and reach the end of the interview and not have to answer the questions. Yes, ma'am. And, and on the subject of Iran, I am offering what should be an, an important contrast that is presented for folks to make a decision and there are critics that they feel who look at what the administration did and say and think differently. <laughs> and he's like and and there are people that think differently than than what you are sharing here. I mean it continues like the last minute it's still like oh my goodness. Uh but that's what I wanted to show you that actions speak louder than words. If we just judge by actions, Kamala Harris is not going to manage the Middle East well.